VSPA is a platform for low latency computation over large evolving data sets, which basically means that's a highly optimized search engine. And the objective is like to return a sorted list of relevant documents from billions or even trillions of documents. It is kind of, it's a platform that's developed by our office and is used across the entire Yahoo for search, media, personalization, so on. So you, if you go to applications like the Flickr application and you submit an image there and it gives you similar images and so on, the platform that's doing this retrieval is that platform that I'm going to talk about. The same thing for serving ads and kind of news recommendation uh, stuff of uh, problems. It's kind of imp impossible to talk about Vespa without uh, talking about the Vespa office, which is located in Trondheim, Norway, and it has a long history. This actually is an office that started in 97 with, the, with Fast, which had at the time the Alder Web search engine that maybe some of you guys have heard about, but at one point it was bigger than Google until it was acquired by Overture, which was an American company that had this kind of uh, innovative pay for placement search uh, ad services. And then uh, right after this acquisition, Overture itself was acquired by Yahoo. And that's kind of the current brand that we, that we hold because of that. And you probably have seen lately in the news that the Yahoo core business was acquired by Verizon. And uh, the point of this is to show that this product is like more than 20 years of hard work and continuous improvement to get until what it is today. And the reason I'm talking about this product here is because we're planning to open source uh, this platform as soon as possible. And the reason we didn't open source uh, today, for example, it's not open source now, is because of this uh, acquisition here. So legally, we had to postpone, uh, postpone this, uh, the open source, but it's definitely on the roadmap and should, uh, should come soon. So the obvious features that you expect when you talk about search engine is to have this kind of document curd operations to be done in low latency, high throughput, and real time. Right? Basically, what you, ha what you get is when you send queries, you have a lot of documents indexed. You want to select and search over those documents, but also rank so that you, you, you give back a uh, sorted list of, uh, of documents back. And you want features like dy dynamic grouping, aggregating the data that you're actually going to return so that it can be easily displayed in the front end that you have. One thing that's really nice about Vespa is the kind of latency throughput trade-off flexibility that we have. So basically, you can, in your application, sacrifice latency to increase your throughput, for example. The only thing you need to do is like to change the number of search, uh, the thread per search, and this will lead you to better utilize the resource that you have, right? So you don't have to just add more nodes to increase throughput if, you, if your latency is low enough that you can sacrifice a little bit. And of course, it uh, and that's the important point to keep in mind. W I'm talking here about really scalable things. So at Yahoo, we deal with billions of documents, and the, the answer needs to come back in milliseconds. So scalability is the main issue, right? So at Yahoo, we have elastic and auto-recovery stateful clusters, like the contents that you hold. We have applications that range from a single to kind of hundreds of nodes. You can actually start to develop this at your local machine, and then you just deploy this to the cloud. So we have, for example, one application that has 800 nodes and it acts like 2.5 trillion of documents and you still need to serve those documents in milliseconds. We also have cases where you need to scale on the query side. So one good example is when you want to map your query to a semantic space. So nowadays it's very popular to use word to vec to represent words. And then you, maybe your query is a phrase. You want to break that down in tokens and transform that tokens into word to vec and aggregate that. And you need to do that when the query comes. So a lot of things need to be stored on memory to make sure you can process this really quick before you send the query, the final query down to the back end. Or you can scale both in the query side and the document size. It, the important thing is that it's really, it's just a matter of as many nodes as you need. So it's a cost issue. It's never a cost of can we do that in that time period. We always can, but it's a cost issue, right? You need to, to increase the number of nodes you, you have, potentially. 
So a, a very high level uh, architecture of Vespa is the only thing that users need to be concerned is this uh, bluish box, which we call the application package, which is basically a folder that contains configuration files that will define how your search engine will behave. Because as I said, this is a general but flexible search engine. It, it needs to work for image search. It needs to work for text search. It needs to work for any kind of document types you have and that you want to get retrieved. So basically, it has like two containers. One is stateless container that basically is fully customizable by Java plugins. And then you can customize like document processors, which means that documents that you're feeding to the search engine can be pre-processed before they're fed. So maybe you want to run models on that unit here. So you get a document, a text document, and you want to classify what type of document it, that is. You can have models here that will run before it's sent to, to, to the search engine. You also have this, what you call search, searchers component which are Java plugins you can write. So you get a query, you pre-process that query before you send to the back end. And when the results come back, you can also pre-process the results you get back. And this is where all the customization goes for defining how your VS publication will work. And we have these stateful containers, which is basically hold the actually documents that you send to Vespa. It's all indexed, distributed across many nodes, and it we deal with this replication to avoid data loss and stuff like this. And this is where the actual distributed computation happens. So it's used for, it's uh, the, norm, the norm now, right? So you move the computation to where the data is. Uh, as I said, like you, what you want is get a sorted list of results back. So you need to have a form of ranking framework built in at the core of the search engine. And this comes with challenges. So the first I will define how, uh, in a high level, how the, the, this match and ranking framework works. The matching phase is where we kind of find all the documents that match your query. And your query can be very general. Basically, technically, like it's a tree of operators, where you have many operators to kind of form the kind of logic that you want to, to match. And the goal of this phase is, of course, is keeping all the documents that has no uh, no meaning for you at that particular query. And all this is, of course, evaluated in parallel. And those queries, they can be passed from outside, just a HTTP request with the query using this YQL language, which is open sourced. Or you can also programmatically construct query based on searches. So for example, if you have a blog recommendation that I'll talk uh, about later, you, you, you might want to send just the, do the user ID. And on this searcher, you understand like, oh, this user ID number three, let's get his user profile, and that's what we're going to send uh, down to the back end. Then once you have matched the documents, you have the ranking, which is actually going to sort the documents that you want to return. And usually you, you only want to return the top best ranked documents, right? So this phase, it, it works by ranking expressions, where we will compute a rank score from features. Okay, so it like, might be a math uh, expression where the features that we, we have for, to, to execute is document features, so information contained in your documents that you want to take into account. So data that comes from the query, so we call query features. But we also have these match features, which is features that were computed in the matching phase when you were trying to, to kind of uh, search for documents that make sense for your query. It's also it's a two-phase ranking framework. So in the first phase, ranking, we compute the expression that you define for the first phase uh, doing matching, meaning that that expression that you define will be run in every document that match. Okay? Uh, and then after that, it's, we have an optional second phase ranking where you can have another s expression, to, but that will be run only on the top n documents that come from the first phase. And the reason to have this first phase, second phase is that is for speed, right? We need to return the re results in milliseconds, which means that usually this first phase, since it's going to be evaluated in a lot of matching documents, should be simpler and faster. And then you have the option in a second phase, the most promising candidates just run a very complex kind of model on that best uh, candidate. Of course, from a data science point of view, it's very important that you know what you're doing, that kind of the model you have in the first phase and the model you have in the second phase, they are somehow correlated because 
you know, otherwise you're just not doing the right thing because you're first ranking according to one thing and then comes a second model and completely changes everything. So it should basically, the kind of first phase model should be a simplified version of the second phase uh, model, something like this. But uh, those kind of rank framework, it comes with challenges. So historically, the search engine were kind of optimized for vector-vector computation, where most of the things you do is when you kind of have dot products and you want to m match, uh, get doc uh, documents that are closer to the query and so on. And the data that you have is usually or in the documents or in the query, right? The implications of that is that first, large multi-dimensional models become slow with vector-vector computation. You can can't really go the neural networks uh, with, with that assumption. So large model parameter space, which is very common nowadays, are also not well supported because where are you going to store the model parameters? You cannot store in a document type because it means that every time a query comes, you first need to get the model parameters and then use that in a second query to rank your results. And if you have a large permit space, this would be expensive. And also, you, under these constraints, you have no way to, to use frequently updated models. So our response for that was uh, what we call tensor framework. And basically, first, we, we, we had to define that tensor data structure, which basically is a multidimensional array, in our case, with named dimensions that can represent not only scholars and vectors, but also matrices and higher dimensional data structures. And also another change that is introduced of this is that the tensors then might hold document data, they might hold query data, but now they have these global tensors as well. And the difference of the global tensors is that they don't, do not depend on the documents you are being indexed or on the query that you send. Uh, they are kind of available in local memory during ranking. And they can be statical, sta static, where meaning that they are deployed. If you remember this application package that contains the configuration of the VESPA, you can also have a file with the model parameters there, and this will be deployed as a global tensor. Or it can be dynamic, where you continuously update that parameters with a high height uh, that's stored in a server, for example. And this, uh, for us, changes everything because now basically we have uh, data structure to hold the, the parameters of the model, not only the data. Once you have this, you also need, of course, to have a tensor math, right? You need to, uh, it's not enough to have the data structure, you need to, to know how to combine those things. And we also develop a tensor math, which is basically primitive operations uh, that's inspired by functional programming. So like map, reduce, and apply, and so on. And the kind of things you can do with it is like multiplication, where you kind of take all possible combination of cells over two tensors. This is really important for data scientists, because let's say you kind of, you have on your document, you have, or your user, you have age and gender, and you want to construct a model that actually takes all combination of these two tensors. Instead of you providing the exploded sets, you only have to provide the smaller data sets, and we combine that on the fly. Uh, and this saves a lot of kind of data that you need to send. And of course, you, 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 ca you need to have some form of reduction, where basically means that you can write expressions like that, and it will make sense. Because here, for example, we are combining data from the attribute of a document with data from the query. By combining that, meaning exploding that data and have all possible combinations of features that's contained on those two tensors. And then you have a global tensor, which is, provides the kind of parameter values for each of those combinations that you have. So this is like expressions like that allow us to express FTRL or neural nets kind of model in the ranking. OK, so just to illustrate kind of how would be the, the usage of that in practice, I just walked through a very, very simple blog recommendation example. So the data set that was used here is from WordPress, the dot com, and basically contains a collection of blog posts and also user actions, in this case it was likes, that were done on those blog posts. This data was available dur during a Kaggle competition to predict which blog post someone would like based on their past behavior. So as, as a user that would use that platform, what you, you, you would have just to specify some files on the application package. So in this case, it would be, 
like three sets of files, like service.xml, which is, is about like 15 lines. Basically, is where you say which service you want to run and how many nodes per service you want. So as a service, you can have like query processing, as I mentioned, document processing, and also what are the type of content nodes that you're going to store your documents. Then in the, in the second set of file, you have which host will run the services. So you specify here the nodes, and here you say kind of basically the address of the nodes uh, that you're going to use. And then that third set of files is the search definition files, where you need to have one per document type, uh, where you kind of define the schema of the data, and also the rank profile, which contains information on how you're going to order the documents to, to be retrieved. In this example, we'll have two search definitions, uh, one for blog posts to, to kind of tell how I'm going, what kind of data fields is on the blog post, like title, content, and stuff like that. And we also have, in this case, one user search definition, which basically say it will hold uh, profile information about users, so that when a user ID comes, you can go there to get what's their user profile. So once you have those three, three sets of files ready, which shouldn't take long, you can deploy your application, use one rank profile in the blog search definition file. And this rank profile here is the, one of the simplest you can get, which basically is a native search. So in Vespa, we have this native rank, which is a kind of very specialized matching, text matching kind of uh, ranking expression that basically is saying here, if I send a query down, like let's say soccer match, it will scan it will match all documents that match that criteria and also is scan in all the titles and contents. And it, it will return to you the best kind of match that you got. So basically, once you have this small rank profile there, you feed your data basically via HTTP requests, and then you can, it's ready for query. So this is actually done in a local, local machine. So you just send a query, say music, and it will return all blog posts with music, the best one with, for example, if there's music in, in the title, it's more important than only having the content and stuff like that. So with this, you have like a basic search engine that's ready to use and scalable and fast, right? But of course, you might want to do more things if you want to recommend blog posts, then you, you need to go a bit beyond. So let's say we have a simple collaborative filtering, right? In this case, we just we, we train uh, a collaborative filtering in Spark. Uh, which means that in the end we have user latent factors and document latent factors based on the training data. What you can do, you're going to feed that latent factors to, to Vespa. So basically you're going to have a tensor field in the user search definition that holds the user latent factor as if it was like a user profile. And you, the same thing you do, you, f you, you feed this document latent factor to the, to the blog post document type. Again, this feeding is for HTTP. You can feed from Hadoop directly where you train the model, for example. And then now, let's say, now that we have this, we have this a user profile and have information about the, the, the document. And you want to combine those uh, to say that, OK, if I, g I get a user ID, I want to go down there, get this user prof uh, this tensor field with the user latent factor, which on the schema we, we, we call the user item CF. This, this is query is to say that this comes from the query. Okay, so get this file and get also the same user item CF from the documents and combine those in a simple dot product sense. So basically, now, now with this changing by using that rank profile, which is tensor, called tensor, you basically, when you get a user ID, you will get back recommendation based on what you have learned in your collaborative filtering algorithm. And it's like, it's that simple. It means that you, you, you train your model, and now you can use that model on your search engine without much code to, to glue. You don't have to do much gluing to, to, to get it done. But you might want to go beyond, right? What happens nowadays is, what I show there, we have a user vector and a document vector. We, we just combine simply by a dot product, and this is uh, what you use as a as a relevancy metric. Uh, you might want to get this user uh, profile and document vector and combine using a more complex model, for example. So in this case, just to show, we kind of use a two-layer fully connected neural network. We train that model in TensorFlow, 
Okay? Then now, if you see, we are going to use the first phase and second phase that I discussed before, where the first phase will be, will be computed for all documents that match, which is exactly the same rank expression that I showed in the previous slide. Now that you have those based on collaborative filtering ranked, you're going to get the top 200 of those documents, the best kind of candidate, and you kind of will run a model, which is a ten TensorFlow type of model. Uh, you also say where you can find the parameters of the model that you have trained uh, before, and you also say that on that model file, what's x and what's y. In this case, x is the, 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 the user vector that comes from the query, and the y is the uh, document vector uh, that you find. And that's it. And once you have that and you rerun, it will have a more accurate model because it will kind of get the top, top 200, rerank using a more complex model that have been shown to outperform the, the, the simple, simple dot product. So like when you kind of use things like that, you can get sometimes good improvement with very low cost in the deployment side, right? Of course, the, the science work continues to be demanding, right? You need to find good models and so on. So the whole point here is to make sure that people can deploy those things at scale without glue codes at all, and it's all implemented in very efficient uh, manner, right? I'm not sure how I'm in. I think I have five minutes. So the, the, the important thing is that you these kind of things enable. So like you can do semantic clustering, basically. If you have a model, so you cluster your documents around. So you have a big set of documents, you do some clustering algorithm. You can actually, when you feed in the model to Vespa, you first say, you pre-process that model and say which cluster that document belongs. And you annotate that document with the cluster that he belongs. And then the same thing when a query comes, because it's like you have this custom Java plugins. So the same Java plugin that you use to pre-process the model, you can use to pre-process the query. So when the query comes, you assign watch what's the cluster that that query belongs in terms of semantic space, if it's a text kind of query. And then on the search engine, it will only look, it will first filter, so match only documents from that cluster. So we have cases that we reduce the cost by 100 times with almost no loss in accuracy. So we went like, we had to scan a billion documents, and we end up having to scan only 100,000 documents in the matching phase because of this kind of clustering, and because we support to run those kind of models uh, in our platform. Um, another important thing is, well, uh, I'm not sure if all of you guys remember, but Hadoop was also open source from Yahoo, right? So, and, Hadoop has been great to do like this kind of batch, uh, batch job data training and so on. So our hope is that Vespa is like the other side of the picture, which is far from the batch size where you can take your time. You have high latency to a very low latency search engine to serve everything that you have computed there. So of course, because of that, we, we have very good connections with the kind of Hadoop eco ecosystem. So all the times that I said that we could feed data to, to Vespa, it's, you can feed it from Hadoop, which is very uh, nice because kind of usually train models there. It's also nice that you can query Vespa so from Hadoop because what happens sometimes is you have your application running there and you want to send a lot of queries to kind of test your models and you get the results back. And it's really useful when you can ha write a pig script that send all these queries in parallel, get all the results, store in a database, and do some analysis and so on. So we can do that as well. And all kind of relevance computation that's done in Vespa. So you have a real applications running. When something happens, uh, so when, like you have a Flickr kind of application running, all, every query that comes there, there's a lot of computation. It's all stored in Hadoop that you can analyze later. This has been great for data scientists to kind of uh, improve improve their applications. And because of this connection with Hadoop, it makes much easier to do offline tests before deploying because you have this connection very easily accessible. And uh, basically, that's it.